Through Zen practice, we can observe firsthand how our brains shape our experiences and perceptions. It's a journey into the neural underpinnings of consciousness itself. James H. Austin, Zen and the Brain. Spiritual awakening is not just a matter of faith or belief. It has a neurobiological basis. Our brains are wired to seek meaning and connection, and neurotheology helps us unravel the mysteries of how the brain supports our spiritual journeys. Dr. Lisa Miller. The study of neurotheology allows us to explore the biological basis of spiritual experiences. It reveals how the brain processes and interprets our encounters with the divine, offering a bridge between science and spirituality. Dr. Andrew Newberg. In this video, we will explore the complex and thought-provoking relationship between spirituality and the brain. If, at the end of the video, you find that you are interested in going deeper into this topic or any other spiritual topic, please visit our online bookstore, Asangoham Books, where we have compiled curated book lists on this subject and a wide variety of other spiritual and philosophical topics. You can find the link to Asangoham Books online bookstore in the description of this video. The human brain is the most complex and intricately organized organ in the known universe. It comprises approximately 86 billion neurons, and each neuron has thousands upon thousands of synaptic connections. These produce electrical and chemical signals, giving rise to our thoughts, emotions, memories, as well as our most profound spiritual insights. In this video, we will explore how our brain processes spiritual experiences by examining the neural underpinnings of prayer, meditation, and mystical experiences. We will also look at how the latest neuroscientific research may explain the experience of near-death experiences, NDEs, while also giving us insight into the event of bodily death itself. By drawing on the emerging academic field of neurotheology, we can explore the relationship between neuroscience and religious or spiritual experience. One major focus of neurotheology is the investigation of specific brain regions and their role in religious experiences. For example, studies have examined the role of the temporal lobe, which has been linked to intense religious experiences, altered states of consciousness, and mystical encounters. Functional neuroimaging techniques, such as fMRI and PET scans, are used to observe brain activity when individuals engage in prayer, meditation, or other religious practices. These studies have identified patterns of neural activity associated with feelings of spiritual connection and transcendence, shedding light on the neural correlates of religious and mystical experiences. Additionally, neurotheology explores how religious and spiritual practices may influence brain function and structure. Researchers in neurotheology have investigated the impact of meditation, prayer, and other contemplative practices on the brain. This has revealed how regular engagement with spiritual practices may lead to long-term changes in neural connectivity and function. The field also delves into the neurological aspects of religious rituals, moral decision-making, and the perception of religious symbols and narratives. Neurotheology offers a fascinating perspective on the interplay between the human brain and spirituality. Though a relatively new academic field, neurotheology has gone a long way to unraveling the biological basis of our spiritual and religious practices and experiences. One of the earliest explorations of this relationship between consciousness, spirituality, and the brain was a book published in 1976, a book that remains both influential and controversial to this day, The Origins of Consciousness in the Bicameral Mind, by Julian Jaynes. Julian Jaynes, 1920-1997, was an American psychologist and philosopher who held various teaching positions, including Princeton University and the University of Toronto. Jaynes became known for his interdisciplinary approach to psychology, drawing from philosophy, linguistics, and neuroscience. However, it was for his theory of the bicameral mind for which he became most widely known. This theory proposed that early humans experienced a radically different subjectivity than we do today. In our modern-day experience of subjectivity, we assume internal thoughts to be our thoughts. Jaynes' theory was that early humans lacked this type of subjectivity, and instead operated under a bicameral mentality. A bicameral subjectivity perceived thoughts as external voices and not as thoughts thought by oneself. 
Jains proposed that early humans therefore interpreted these thoughts or external voices as commands from gods or the divine. This radically different notion of subjectivity of early humans laid the foundation for an understanding of God or the divine as apart from us. According to Jains, this bicameral mindset persisted for thousands of years and was instrumental in organizing early societies. With the breakdown of the bicameral mind, a very gradual process triggered by social, cultural, and environmental changes, the subjectivity that we experience today, that is, that we are the producers of our thoughts, began to emerge. However, with the breakdown of the bicameral mind, our notion of the divine or God separated from us has remained. Jane suggests that it is the evolution in human subjectivity that has led us to the mode of religious subjectivity that we experience today. That is a religious subjectivity, for most, where we experience our thoughts as our own, that we are the thinkers of our thoughts, and that God or the divine exists apart from us somewhere else. While this book remains controversial, it did initiate a discussion of how modes of subjectivity may evolve over time, and that the type of subjectivity we experience determines the type of religious understanding and consciousness we have the capacity for. In 2008, the neuroscientist Jill Bolter Taylor gave a TED talk where she describes in vivid detail what happened when she suffered a stroke and the shutdown of the left hemisphere of her brain. Jill Bolter Taylor's TED talk, My Stroke of Insight, achieved extraordinary success. Currently, it has almost 30 million views on YouTube. Taylor's talk fascinated viewers with its suggestion that the relationship between the left and right hemispheres of the brain may play a pivotal role in spiritual and mystical experience. Jill Bolt Taylor explains that the stroke occurred in the left hemisphere of her brain, which is responsible for functions like language, analytical thinking, and linear processing. As this part of her brain started to shut down, she felt her cognitive functions gradually deteriorate. Taylor lost her ability to process language and to think in the conventional structured manner that we typically associate with conscious thought. She goes on to describe how this loss of left hemisphere function led to an extraordinary shift in her perception. With the left hemisphere malfunctioning, her consciousness became more centered in her right hemisphere. The right hemisphere of the brain is associated with creativity, intuition, and holistic perception. In this state, she felt a profound sense of interconnectedness with the universe, experiencing herself as an integral part of a greater whole. She describes her mental state as peaceful, expansive and blissful, with a heightened awareness of the present moment and a deep sense of oneness with everything around her. Taylor's description of her brain's transformation during her stroke highlights how a shift in brain function can radically alter our experience of reality. Do we have to have a stroke to have such an expansion of consciousness? Fortunately, no. Many spiritual practices such as meditation and mindfulness, are in fact methods in which to replicate in the brain what was experienced by Jill Bolter Taylor during her stroke. That is, a quieting of discursive thought, or our constant internal chatter. For many years, neuroscience believed discursive thought to be exclusively located in the left hemisphere of the brain. However, since the early 2000s, neuroscientists have identified a brain network that utilizes both hemispheres of the brain as being responsible for discursive thought or the constant chatter of thought. That network they called the Default Mode Network, or DMN. Its discovery emerged through the use of functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, and other neuroimaging techniques. The DMN was identified when researchers noticed that certain brain regions exhibited increased activity when participants were at rest, not engaged in specific tasks, and their minds were free to wander. For example, when we are not involved in a task and are at rest, our minds will tend to daydream or drift into thoughts of the past or future and even begin to worry. When we are completely absorbed by a task or activity, then our default mode network ideally quietens and another brain network takes over, the task positive network or the TPN. To give another example, if you are deeply engaged in an activity such as drawing or playing a musical instrument, the DMN will quieten and the TPN will take over. Also, the TPN can be active subconsciously, 
In fact, 95% of the TPN's processing power is subconscious. The relative conscious processing power of the TPN is a relatively tiny 5%. That is to say, if one is working on a difficult solution to a problem, the TPN will often work to find an answer or solution while one is not consciously thinking about the problem. This accounts for the often reported situation of someone waking from sleep with the solution to a long wrestled with problem, or the mathematician or scientist suddenly coming upon the long sought for answer while taking a shower. These two networks ideally operate in an anti-correlated manner, meaning that when one is active, the other is less active, and vice versa. However, in someone suffering from ADHD or ADD, that is, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or Attention Deficit Disorder, the DMN often does not turn off or quieten. This means that the person is often flooded with thoughts while trying to perform an activity or task. In other words, they cannot be fully present in the moment. This inability to turn off the DMN and to be fully present in the moment can have a wide range of ill effects. An overly active DMN has been associated with not only disorders such as ADHD and ADD, but also with depression, anxiety, and even Alzheimer's disease. This is where the practice of meditation and mindfulness can help. In his 1,000-page book, Zen and the Brain, Toward an Understanding of Meditation and Consciousness, published in 1998, neurologist, neuroscientist, and longtime Zen Buddhist practitioner, James H. Austin explores the default mode network and its intriguing relationship with Zen Buddhism. Austin suggests that Zen practices, particularly meditation, can influence the DMN's activity, leading to a reduction in self-referential thinking and the dissolution of the egoic sense of self. Through meditation, individuals may experience a quieting of the DMN and a shift toward a state of mindfulness and present moment awareness. This aligns with the Zen principle of non-attachment to the ego and the encouragement of direct experiential awareness of the present. Furthermore, Austin proposes that the alteration of DMN activity through meditation may be linked to the sense of interconnectedness and oneness that is central to Zen Buddhist teachings. By reducing the prominence of the narrative self, meditation may open the door to a direct experience of unity with the universe and a deeper understanding of the interdependence of all things. Austin's examination of the DMN reveals the neural mechanisms underlying the transformative potential of Zen meditation and its capacity to shift one's perception from ego-centered to more expansive and interconnected states of consciousness. Near-death experiences or NDEs challenge our understanding of consciousness, what happens after bodily death, and thus, the very nature of human existence. These extraordinary encounters typically occur when an individual is on the brink of death, often during life-threatening situations such as cardiac arrest or traumatic injuries. During NDEs, individuals report a range of vivid experiences, including traveling through a tunnel, encountering deceased loved ones, entering a realm of light, and feeling a deep sense of peace and unity with the universe. NDEs have been interpreted in various ways, often attributing them to spiritual or supernatural causes. We can also begin to understand NDEs via their relationship to the brain's default mode network. It has been shown that during NDEs, the DMN often has reduced activity or even disruption. Dr. Jimo Borjigin at the University of Michigan has conducted studies on rats and found that during cardiac arrest, when brain activity typically ceases, there is a brief surge of highly synchronized brain activity, potentially providing a neuroscientific basis for some aspects of NDEs. While this research does not fully explain the rich and diverse experiences reported in NDEs, it raises questions about the role of the brain in mediating these phenomena. The DMN's reduction in activity during NDEs may allow for altered states of consciousness, where individuals often perceive themselves as separate from their physical bodies or experience so-called transcendental or mystical states. The notion of ego dissolution and interconnectedness reported in some NDEs is also reminiscent of the right hemisphere's functions in the brain as experienced by Jill Bolta Taylor during her stroke. Research into NDEs has also suggested that these experiences are a result of altered brain chemistry, such as the release of endorphins or the activation of certain neurotransmitters. 
This perspective suggests that the brain's response to life-threatening situations can lead to the generation of vivid and emotionally charged experiences, including encounters with deceased loved ones and a sense of entering a different realm. However, the exploration of NDEs by neuroscientists has also raised questions about the nature of consciousness itself. While NDEs occur during periods of compromised brain function, the richness and coherence of the reported experiences often defy the expected limitations of a brain in distress. This has led some neuroscientists to consider the possibility that consciousness may exist independently or outside of the physical brain. A similar approach in contemporary philosophy is the emerging and growing area of inquiry called panpsychism. Panpsychism is the philosophical theory that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of the universe, existing in everything, from particles to organisms. Regardless of how NDEs are interpreted, these altered states of consciousness often have a profound and lasting effect on individuals' lives. These include a reduced fear of death, enhanced spiritual understanding, and a greater appreciation for the interconnectedness of all living beings. This can have significant implications, not only for individuals, but also for society as a whole, deeply influencing our attitudes toward death and dying, spirituality, and of the meaning and purpose of life. The human brain, with its staggering complexity, is the foundation not only for our thoughts, emotions and memories, but also for our most profound spiritual experiences. The fields of neurotheology and neuroscience can offer valuable frameworks that help to bridge the gap between neuroscience and spirituality. While the study of consciousness, spirituality, and the brain remains a complex and evolving field, it has made significant strides in unraveling the biological basis of our spiritual and religious experiences. The groundbreaking work of figures like Julian Jaynes, Jill Bolter Taylor, and James H. Austin provides valuable insights into the relationship between the brain and spiritual experiences. However, we must always be careful not to regard the brain and its functions merely atomistically. That is, we must always remember that the limits to the brain do not stop at its physical boundaries, but extend infinitely throughout the universe and beyond. For how could a brain exist without a universe, or indeed a universe without a brain? Thus surely, the brain's actual boundaries are nowhere, and its center, everywhere.